is September 10, 2016, and we'll continue with, uh, still in the midnight, and uh, midnight cry. But uh, last time, it was two weeks ago, that we are studying about um, the rabbinical reckoning, Karyat reckoning, and the Karyat reckoning used biblical understanding of calculating the first day of the first month using what? What, what did Karyat reckoning use? How did they collect? Well, yeah. As compared to rabbinical. Reckoning used what? Jill, remember what rabbinical reckoning used? The spring equinox. Mm -hmm. And what happened to the Millerites when they used the spring equinox to calculate their first day of the first month? What happened to them? Well, they actually got it was March. And what happened to them? They were disappointed. So if they used the Spring Equinox to figure out their, their first day of the first month, they're going to be, they were disappointed. So, the Millerites' history happens in our history. We use the Spring Equinox to figure out our first day of the first month. We're going to be disappointed. I have to use barley harvest. But this is spiritual also, right? Okay. So we are going to continue. We ended up uh, showing up a showing a showing how the Millerites figured out October 20, 1844. They had to align Gregorian calendar with Jewish calendar. All right. So they said, "Oh, okay. Uh, from the time that the." From the time that the um, decree was given, it is for 2,300 days, right? Mm -hmm. So when was, what year was the decree given? 457. 457. So they calculated 2,300 days, 2,300 years, it's 1843. So they said, well, you know what, it's got to be, it's got to end on the last day of the Gregorian calendar, 1843. So they said, wait a minute, that can't be right, because at the time of, uh, in that time of the Jews, they didn't use Gregorian calendar. So we can't use that reckoning, we have to use Jewish reckoning. So what did they do? They ask the Jews, say, hey, how do you reckon your calendar? It's, the current, it's according to the... Well, no, at that time, they say it's a rabbinical method. Yeah, because uh, this was in 1844. They said, well, it's, we use the rabbinical method. We use the... What do we use? The spring equinox. So they use the spring equinox. And the spring equinox happened on March 21 in 1844 and that's called the Miller's disappointment right there right mm -hmm. it was Miller's so they were disappointed when they used the spring equinox rabbinical method so they they had to recalculate they go wait a minute it can't be rabbinical because that's not even biblical that's Babylonian mm -hmm. we have to use the barley harvest so when they use the barley harvest what what did they find No, they found the first day of the first month is, is actually on April 19, right? Because that's the first day of the first month, based on the barley harvest. But did, were they disappointed? Yeah, they were disappointed. Did Jesus come then? No, they, Jesus didn't come then. So there was this, this was called their first disappointment, right? So even though they, they had the barley harvest correct, they were still disappointed because what was their error? 
the fullness of the year, right? The fullness of the year. So they said, oh, okay, it's, it's got to be autumn to autumn. So when they calculated autumn to autumn, they said, oh, okay, it has to be on the, in the autumn. So they, ha they said, there has to be sometime in the autumn, All right? Now, when they arrived at the first disappointment here, they realized they were living the, the, the history or the story of uh, the ten virgins. And they had to, what, what did they have to do? The ten virgins had to tarry. So they were in the tarrying time. Okay? All right. And the tarrying time is a fulfillment of what prophecy? When you, blessed are those who wait until the 1335, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So it's the end of the 1335. All right. Okay. So this is the first day of the first month. It's the end of the 1335 because they, they started the tearing time right here. And 1335 ends here because this is those who are tearing are blessed. Right? 1335 ends right there. And this, this is the first day of the first month. Okay. According to Ezra 7, 9, which they studied and they understood to be able to figure out October 22, 1844, the first day of the first month is when Ezra he began to come up from Babylon. And on the first day of the first month, he came to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. And what happened to him as he went out of Babylon? He had to stop at the river. What's the name of the river that he had to stop at? Ahava. Ahava. What happened? Jill, what happened at Ahava? He had to? Yeah. What happened when he tarried at River Ahava? What did he find out? What did he find out? Remember the story? Ezra. He went out. He came out of Babylon. He went to Ahava. He stayed there. And what did he look around and he said, Wait a minute. There's only us priests coming out. That's what he called the Levites. Yeah. Can we actually have a can we have a tabernacle service in Jerusalem with only priests? No. What do you have to have? Who do you have to have? Levites. Yeah. And who else? Nathanims. And Nathanims. You got to have priests, Levites and Nathanims. Right? What's the job of the nethanims? The menial stuff. Right, but they're, they're important. You can't, have a mean, you can't have a temple service without the nethanim. You can't have it without the Levites. You, have to, you can't have it without priests. You got to have priests, Levites, and nethanims. So he says, so what did he do? He made a call to come out of Babylon. So what is the call of to come out of Babylon? Which angel's message is the call to come out of Babylon? Second, angel. second angel's message. So he gave the second angel's message on the first day of the first month to come out of Babylon. To who? To the Levites and the... No, not the priests. The Levites, the priests already came out. Who, who was he calling out? The, the Levites and the Nephilims, right? So they came out. In the right, it's the first day. Right, okay. So, so that's a very important because we realize that when we come out the first day of the first month, this will eventually line up with 9-11. The priests come out at 9-11 and then eventually the priests have to call out the Levites, right? And then they come out and then the Nethanims also eventually come out, right, at the Sunday law, right? Uh, that's, so this is like a fractal. Okay, but anyway, when do they arrive? On the first day of the first month. And that, when you calculate, if you know that this is April 19, then you can figure out this is August 15. What happened on August 15? What happened, what happened on August 15, 1844? It's 
yeah, it's the midnight cry, right? What happened? There was a camp exeter. Right, Exeter camp meeting, August 12 to 17. Who was there? Samuel Snow, right? He came in. He came in on the which date, actually? He came in on the 14th. He gave the message once, and they said, oh, no, you, you know, you, we, need, we, need, we need for you to repeat that message again. So he repeated the message on the 15th, because there's a doubling always at a midnight cry. So this is the midnight cry. He gave it on the 14th. He repeated it on the 15th. There's a doubling at midnight cry. Samuel Snow gave it right there, right? And, and what did he preach? That Jesus is going to come on October 22, 1844. Okay. I have a, I'm going to read a quote. We did, we, we've done this before. It's just a review. We, uh, he, I, this is by J.N. Loughborough, who was, who was not there uh, when Samuel Snow was preaching. All right, Samuel Snow, this is uh, Samuel Snow making a, a question and answer with the audience, all right? And John Loughborough uh, recorded this in his book, The Great Second Advent Movement, page 522. Brother Snow thus questioned them. Where are we in our Advent experience? Answer from the audience. In the tearing time. Okay. They said, okay, we know that we are in the tearing time. Right. How long was the vision to tarry? And the answer was, until midnight. What is a day in prophecy? Answer, a year. Right. A day is a year. So then what would be a night be? Answer, Six months. Then what would midnight be? Answer, three months. How long have we been in the tarrying time? So they were in the tarrying time. They know it was the first day of the first month. They were disappointed. Their first disappointment, right? How long have we been in the tarrying time? Answer, three months. And then what did he say? Samuel Snow said, Then it is just the midnight now. And I am here with the midnight cry. In a few sentences, he explained that it was the fall of 457 that the decree went forth. And so they were short six months in their reckoning. See, right here they were short six months. They had to go here, right? They were too fast by six months. This is when they believe Jesus will come. I mean, sorry, right here they were short. They were still short here in the tearing time. It has to be in October. Right? It would, the 2300 days would terminate on October 22, 1844, instead of the spring as they had previously supposed. They thought it was spring, right there. It should be in the fall, in the seventh month here, the tenth day of the seventh month, right there. Then in a strong voice he said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh on the tenth day of the seventh month, October 22, 1844. Go ye out and meet him all right so what happened right there october 22 10th day of the seventh month so this is how the millwrights figured out october 22 1844 all those understandings that they have to go through to know when they said that jesus is going to come but what happened in october 22 1844 did jesus come in the cloud Yes, he came in the cloud, but did he come to earth? He went to the Ancient of Days, right? Yeah, he went to the Ancient of Days. He went on the cloud and he went to the most holy place to start the investigative judgment, right? It started with the judgment of the what here, right? In the, here it started the judgment of the what? The dead. The dead. So on October 22, that's a fulfillment of what prophecy? This, and on April 19, first day of the first month, is the fulfillment of 1335, right? It ends right here. That's the second angel's message being given right here. Because, because Ezra, remember, he went out 
And he said, wait a minute, there's no Levites. He had to, he had to call his Levite brothers come out of Babylon. He said, I had to give the second angel's message. So this is where the second angel's message is given. Okay, the tenth day of the seventh month, this is the, the fulfillment of what prophecy right here? The, what what prof prophecy? 2300 days. And Ellen White said, this is the fulfillment of just one prophecy? No, there's more than just one prophecy. There's prophecies. We know it's the 2300 days, but we also know it's the of the 2520 also. So the 2300 days ends right here, right? So right here is second angel's message. Here is the third angel's message being given, right? All right, but, but it first started, the midnight cry is the third angel's message because it swells to the loud cry. Anyway, the October 22, 1844, all right? All of this understanding is so important Without this, uh, Adventism foundation was not laid down, right? Uh, this is all Adventism foundation. All right, okay. So first day of the first month. October 22 is 10th day of the... Seventh month. Seventh. Because 10th day of the seventh month is the Pentecost. day of atonement, atonement. not atonement. Pentecost. Not Pentecost. <laughs> day of atonement. What happened on the day of atonement? Christ cleansed the sanctuary. Right? The high priest cleansed the sanctuary, right? The Day of Atonement. He puts his hand on the... One of the lambs. I mean, uh, one of the rams, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Remember? Day of Atonement. We have to know the feasts. You have to know the feast. You have to know chariot reckoning. You have to know so many things to be able to understand all of this. Right? right. If you don't know chariot reckoning, you don't know rabbinical math, or you don't know the feasts, oh, you're, you're, gonna, you're not going to understand October 22, 1844. All right, okay. So, then they were still disappointed. And this is the great disappointment. Because here, they were in error because of, the, because of believing in the spring equinox. Here, they did not understand the the what the uh, fullness of time from fall to fall here they did not understand the true understanding of the sanctuary so they had three errors and had nothing to do with the year zero actually when you said it's it's actually year zero problem it's really not a year zero problem it's rabbinical method fullness of year and understanding of the sanctuary okay all right oh in our time it lines up to the Sunday law and here is the midnight cry and here is 9-11 right first day of the first month 9-11 because what was 1335 uh, this when this lines up with 9-11, this is midnight cry. Where's midnight? Hmm. Did they understand where midnight was? Yeah, they actually understand where midnight was. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at when is midnight, all right? Because it's important for us. Because we are living just before midnight. We have to know when is midnight, right? We have to know it prophetically. So this is, this is very crucial understanding to know when midnight is, because we are about to come to midnight. All right, what does Ellen White say in Great Controversy 398? While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. In the summer of 1844, midway, right here, midway between the time when it had been first thought that the 2300 days would end. When did they think that the 2300 days would end? When they were 
they're d disappointed, right? First day of the first month. They thought it was then. And the autumn of the same year, to which it was afterward found that they extended. The message was proclaimed in the very words of the scripture, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That which led to this movement was the discovery that the decree of Artaxerxes for the restoration of Jerusalem, which formed the starting point for the period of the 2300 days, went into effect in the autumn, or 457, not in the beginning of the year, as they had been formerly believed. Reckoning from autumn 457, 2300 years terminate in the autumn of 1844. So where is midnight? Midway between the first day of the first month and the tenth day of the seventh month. So, okay, let's find out when that is. All right? Okay, this one way, when they really figure out correctly, this is when they thought that Jesus was going to come first. And then this is, okay, well, we have to revise it. This is, I, we think this is when Jesus, we believe this is when Jesus come. When is midnight? In the middle here. Somewhere in between here and here. Okay? That's what Ellen White said, right? Midway. Midway. Mm -hmm. All right. How do you find midway? How do you calculate the day exactly in the middle? We're going to go through that exercise right here. Mm -hmm. 118 days. Okay, I want you to calculate. 118 and 69 days, you know? When you, between here and here is how many days now? 187. Hmm? 187? Yeah. All right. Is it correct? So 187. 187, yeah. Okay. So what is the middle of that 187 days? What is the middle of 187? 93.5. Huh? 93.5? 93 uh -huh. Wait a minute. How is it? The middle of the day, the middle of that is 93 and a half? Yeah, 186. Yeah. It's 187. 187. Yeah, that's true. Okay, what, what the day is the 94th day. There's 93 on one side and 93 on the other side, right? Okay. Yeah. Right? Do you get that? So, uh -huh. Right? 93 on one side, 93 on the other side. It's the 94th day, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the middle of... That's exactly midway between here and here. Yeah. Is the ninety fourth day. Do you get that? Yeah. It's ninety three and a half, but yeah. that's not a day. That's a point. You round so up. it's the ninety fourth. No, you don't. You take the day <laughs> where that is. The ninety three and a half. So you take the day. So ninety three days before, ninety three days after. Yeah. So your what day is uh, the midway? Yeah. Is the ninety fourth day? You get that? No. No, no. no because uh, like no. if you do like it's a, a one day. whole day, a one whole day is 24 hours. You cannot... Oh, 0.5. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry. yeah, yeah How yeah. could it be 93 yeah. and a yeah. half days? It's 0.5. It's 0.5 like 12 o'clock. No, you can't because then, then you go to the middle of the day. Yeah. Because they're at the 93 day already. You're halfway in the fourth day. You're halfway into the 94th day. Oh, it's Tuesday. Oh, it's Saturday. No, it's Friday. Ah. No, it, it's, it's not Friday half, it's Saturday already. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. You got it, Darcy? Yeah. <laughs> it's point five. No, you, you got to go through this exercise to be it's able to know. Five. Yes. It's, yeah, but it's but not a day. It's so, like, so if I give you a slice, it might be a half a slice, but still that's a part of the oh, slice. Oh, 93 is already done. Yes. Yeah, 93 yes. is already uh, done, uh, so why is it 0.5? It's already not oh, okay. So yeah. what is the day that is in the middle between this and this? What is the day? <laughs> is the 94th day is exactly in the middle. That's Why is that exactly in the middle? Because 93 days have passed, and 93 days is still ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you get it? Yeah, I get yeah. it. Right? Okay. I see everybody's yeah. faces are reconciled now. Yes. <laughs> okay, before you were not reconciled. Okay, so it's the 94th day. So what is the 94th day? Let's look at this calendar. Let's count 94 days. This is from the first day of the first month. Okay, now count 94 days. How do you do that? Well, it's easy. This is the 30th day. Plus 29. What is 30 plus 29? 
59 plus 30 again. 59 plus 30. 89. Okay, this is number 89. This is 90, 92, 93. Oh, this is 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94. So this is the 94th day, right? So the fifth day of the the fifth day of the fourth month is the ninety-fourth day. That's exactly in between here and here. This is the Jewish calendar. You gotta use the Jewish calendar, right? This is the first day. And then we gotta convert that back into the Gregorian. Yeah. So what is it? So this is the fifth day of the fourth month, uh -huh. right? And the, now then you go back to the Gregorian calendar. Because, because you're, you're using the Jewish calendar, yeah. right? You get that? Mm -hmm. Fifth day of the fourth month. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the fifth day of the fourth month is exactly midway. Uh -huh. The day that is exactly in between the first day of the fifth month and the the f the here is the tenth day of the seventh month uh -huh. right here the tenth day between here and seven. here yeah it's exact this is the exactly the day in between in the midway all right okay the fifth day of the fourth month is midnight right mm -hmm. okay we we'll just do this slowly all right so the fifth day of the fourth month is midnight. So we put that right there. Fifth day of the fourth month is midnight. midnight. Okay. All right. And that happens on July 21. Mm -hmm. July 21. Mm -hmm. And what happened on July 21 yeah. is when Samuel Snow first gave his... Uh, no, no, no. no was... His... His midnight cry at the Boston Tabernacle. Tabernacle. Oh, okay. On July 21, 1844, he first gave his midnight message at the Boston Tabernacle. So this is midnight, right? Okay. In the Bible, there's only one reference. There's only one. You look in the whole Bible that says the fifth day of the fourth month. There's only one. And that's it, Ezekiel 1. This, in Ezekiel 1, 1 is the only reference in the Bible that mentioning the fifth day of the fourth month. Because there's no such thing in the Bible that says, okay, you know what, Jill, the fifth day on the fourth month is midnight. It doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that the fifth day of the fourth month is Ezekiel was among the captives by the river of Chebar. That the heavens were open and I saw a Mara, a vision. A vision? So, the fifth day of the fourth month is midnight. And at midnight, Ezekiel saw a Mara vision. Does the Mara vision get, is given to the prophets at, in their binding time? Yeah. It is. The Mara and the Mare visions, right, <laughs> is given yeah. in the binding time, yeah. right? Binding time, yeah. Because the, the, the binding time for the priest is between midnight and midnight cry, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. So you receive your Mara and your Mare vision oh. in at midnight, yeah. between midnight and midnight cry. Mm -hmm. That's when you receive, right? Yeah. So now we're putting all these, all these uh, truths together now, okay? All right. So the first day of the first month is 9-11, right? Midnight, we're approaching midnight. That's the fifth day of the fourth month. Midnight cry is the first day of the fifth month. And then this is the Sunday law. The tenth day of the seventh month. We're close here. We're here somewhere. We're still in the tearing time. All right, we're here somewhere. 
July 21. So you, you understand, this is April 19. This is July 21, August 15. October 22. All these now, all these, uh, all these dates become quite important. And then you know, you realize Those first are day. Our timeline. Yeah, this is this is our timeline right here, right. First day of the fifth month. Fifth month. First day of the fifth month. Right. You get uh, all right. So the first day of the fifth month. There's only one reference of it in the Bible, and it was when Ezekiel saw the Mara vision. In the river Chibar. At the river Chibar. Now, remember that Daniel, when he was in his binding time, he was touched three times. Three times. Right? Uh -huh. Daniel was touched three times. The amazing thing is that Ezekiel received three visions, and his first vision is at the river Chibar. Remember, at the river Chibar, he has a Mara vision. What, what's a Mara vision? Uh, As compared to Mare. Mare is the beginning of Christ. Right. And Mara is a reflection. Christ, Christ is in you. Christ in you, you, are, you reflect there. So this is Christ in you. Okay. Right, right there. Yeah. Remember? We convert it back. Yeah. yeah. We you put it back to you put it back to the Gregorian candle calendar and you realize it's actually on the July twenty one. You convert it back. Okay. All right. Okay, so what is this Mara vision that Ezekiel received on the fifth fifth day of the fourth month, which is midnight? So we need to know what is this vision, Mara vision. Remember what vision that is? You go to Ezekiel 1. Here, I will, will just re remember it's the, the wheel within a wheel. What is the wheel within a wheel? We could read the whole thing, but we did it already. He saw a whirlwind, a great cloud, and a fire, and brightness. And out of there was a color of amber in the midst of the fire. And four living creatures with the likeness of a man with four faces and four wings. And there was how many wheels? There was four wheels. Yeah. One wheel with each creature, right? And what is the significance of the four wheels? The only thing is that it's complicated. Right? It's complicated. The four wheels are complicated. You know, oh yeah, we study about this. Right. Right. So the four wheels, and Ezekiel saw the four wheels. The you remember the song? There's a song about it. Ezekiel saw the wheel, wheel in the middle of the wheel, and it is a complicated mechanism, right? And what does that mean? We studied this before. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go through that drawing. Okay, that vision is comparable to the sixth chapter of Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah was touched. He was touched by a seraphim that had six wings and crying, Holy, 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 Isaiah 6. What is that? Christian leadership? Christian leadership, yeah. Sixth chapter of Isaiah. It's, it is the story of Isaiah, and Isaiah was touched by a seraphim, and Isaiah sees God. And the whole earth was lighted with his, the God's glory. Oh, if the whole earth was lighted with God's glory, which angel is that? The fourth angel. So where did the fourth angel come down in our timeline? 9-11. 9-11. Oh, boy. We're at 9-11. Okay. And what did the angel do? Give him a, uh, give him a live coal and yeah. brought with the tongs from the altar. And he was asked, who will go? And what did Isaiah said? Yeah. Send, me. Send me. And he, what was the admonition? Go tell these people who understand and perceive not. Who are those people that 
do not understand and do not perceive. Laodicea, right? Yeah. They're poor, blind, wretched. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But then, but then Isaiah said in, in verse 11, how long do I have to go and preach to these people? And the angel said, until the desolation. desolation. When is the desolation? desolation. At Sunday law. Uh -huh. You got to preach to these people until <clears throat> their desolation. Right? Yeah, and then what happens at, no. at the desolation? Their, what is finished? Yeah. Who yeah. do you preach to after you're done preaching to them? After that, you preach to the Nathanims now. Then you preach to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So you do your public evangelism after you go to the people who understand and perceive not, Laodicea, until the desolation. So that's Isaiah 6. That is the same as the wheels within the wheels. The wheels within the wheels, which is Ezekiel 1, is represented in the symbol was a confusion to the finite eye. But the hand of wisdom was revealed amid the wheels. Perfect order is brought out of the confusion. Every wheel works in its right place, in perfect harmony with every part of the machinery. All right. So the wheels within the wheels. Okay. Then in Ezekiel 3, verse 22 to 27, he had another vision. And in the hand of the Lord there was there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise, oh, arise. Arise is very important. Mm -hmm. Go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I arose, and went forth into the plain. And behold, the glory of the Lord stood therefore, as the glory which I saw by the river of Chebar. Oh, okay. I'm in the plain, and I remember the glory that was at the, by the river Chebar. Chebar is what? The vision of the wheels, yeah. right? And it's a Mara vision. So at the river of the, when I went to the plain, I remember the river Chivar vision. And I fell on my face, and the Spirit entered me, and set me upon my feet, and spake with me, and said unto me, Go shut thyself within thine house. See, I fell on my face, the Spirit entered me, and I stand up. And doesn't that sound like Daniel, when he, he touched three times? Mm -hmm. yeah, it sounds... Just like Daniel, right? But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee, and they shall bind thee with them. Oh, you're going to be bound. And they shall not go out among them. And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, and thou shalt be dumb, and shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. Oh, don't tell them yet. But then I, when I speak to thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt speak unto them. Then when I tell you, you are going to speak for me. You are going to be my tongue. You are going to be my mouth. And then saith the Lord, He that heareth, let him hear. And he that forbeareth, let him forbear. For they are a rebellious house. So what kind of, what kind of vision is this? When he actually beholds the glory of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord entered him, which is the Spirit, and he was able to stand and then speak. But he was told not to speak yet until he was allowed to do so. And when he was allowed to do so, he was supposed to speak to the rebellious house of Israel. What kind of vision is this when he actually saw the glory of God, the Lord? Is this a Mara or a Mare? It's a Mare. Right? Because he sees the glory of God. Right? He beheld. He's, he beheld. There, he, there you go. It's not that. It's actually. But he also saw it in the river of Chiba. Right. But that, that one is specifically said it's a Mara vision. So this one, you can deduce that this is. Now, can you actually prove that this is the Mare vision? You go to Ezekiel 8. Remember Ezekiel 8? Mm, yeah. That's when yeah, abominations. So yeah. The vision about the abominations. How many abominations? Four, Four abominations. Yeah. Right, And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head and spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions. Now this vision is the Mara to Jerusalem. So he went in a vision, a Mara vision, and what did he see? 
the four abominations of Israel. What are the four abominations of Israel? The image of jealousy and the secret places. The and then what was the Tammuz? Yeah. Weeping for Tammuz. And the fourth one is the elders bowing to the sun, right? The four. Remember all that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just got to. That is a Mare vision. And that Mare vision and to the door of the inner gate that looked toward the north. And there is a sit of the image of jealousy. That's number one, right? Which provokes to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel there was according to the vision that I saw in the plain. So what's the vision in the plain? It's a Mare vision. All right. So the first vision of Ezekiel 1 is a Mara vision. The second vision of Ezekiel 3 is a Mare vision when he's beheld the whole glory God. And then the third vision is a Mara vision where he saw the four abominations. Mm -hmm. This may be, you know, you got to settle this into your mind, you know. Just, just remember, there's four visions. He had a Mare and a Mara vision starting at midnight. We realize he's in his binding time, but because in the binding time you receive those visions, right? Who else had Mara vision? The 12 year old Samuel had a Mara vision, right? How many times was he called? Four. He actually was called four times, but the first three times was different than the fourth one. The first three times he was called and he says, Oh, Eli, did you call me? No. And then the th on the third one, is Amos says, uh, Eli says, well, you know what? God is not calling me anymore. God is now calling this boy. Yeah. Answer, right? Yeah. And on the fourth call, what did he, did he get? He got a chow zone vision. Oh. Right. He, he, no, it's actually not a chow zone vision. He got a judgment vision of what? For the house of, For the house of Eli. Oh, that's why he was he was, he was afraid. Well, what, what, what was going to be the, the judgment? So he had, on his fourth vision, he had a judgment vision of the house of Eli. No, it's actually, a, he actually had a Mara vision. It's a Mara vision. No, it's not a Chauzon vision. It's a Mara vision. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's actually a, it's a Mara. Because... Samuel had a Mara vision. That's Mara vision. Sure. The, the problem is that in those days, the Chao Zone vision is, there's no Chao Zone vision. No. Right? Yeah. Nobody was having a Chao Zone vision. That's why the vision was given, the Mara vision was given to Samuel. And Samuel was given the judgment vision for Eli and his sons. And what happened to Eli and his sons? They died at... The Sunday law, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. John, 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 the yeah. Daniel and John. Daniel received. Yeah. So, well, Daniel received the Mara vision in Daniel 10. He received the Mara vision. He was touched three times. And what happened? He then he understood the Chao Zone vision. Because the Chao Zone vision was what he was going to give. It's the Daniel 10, Daniel 11, and Daniel 12. Yeah. And with the, the main bulk of it is Daniel 11. And that's a Chao Zone vision, right? All the, way from, all the way from Middle Persia, all the way until Michael stands up. That's a Chao Zone vision, remember? We did Daniel 11. Daniel 2 is a Chao Zone. Daniel 7. Because he's looking forward. While John was looking... Mm. Mara vision? vision is. What, what, what vision was it? Yeah. For Daniel. Yeah, that's when when uh, the. Yeah, it's in Daniel eight actually. Daniel eight is the Mara vision. He didn't understand the Mara vision because that's when the twenty three hundred days. Mm -hmm. That is the Arab and the Bogor. And because one saint sent to the other, 2300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Mm -hmm. And he didn't understand that. It was later given an understanding mm -hmm. in Daniel 10. I mean, Daniel 9. Right? So that is the Mare. Because, because the one saint 
was asking, was asking the other saint, and Daniel. Daniel saw that. So he saw the appearance. And one saint is who? Gabriel. The other one is Jesus. So he saw the appearance of Jesus, right? The glory of God. Okay. All right. So that's a mare. mare yeah. All right. So here, Ezekiel had a mara, two maras, and a mare. One mare, yeah. Yeah, mara and a mare. Yeah. Okay. Did Ezekiel see the judgment also? Because Samuel was given the judgment. Uh -huh. Remember? Was, was Daniel, was Ezekiel, is this Ezekiel 8 connected with the judgment? What's Ezekiel 9? It's the judgment, right? Yeah. Execution. Oh, yeah. That's the scary part. Yeah, that's right? the worst of Ezekiel. So, Ezekiel 8, he sees also, so Ezekiel 8 follows, comes right before Ezekiel 9. And it's, right, precedes Ezekiel 9, which is the judgment. So, the stories now are starting to be line upon line. We can see it's the similar. It's similar, right? Okay. All right. So, he receives a mare and a mara vision here. Okay? Yeah. And this is the binding time for the priests. The priests are here. And the binding time for the Levites is right between here. And the binding time for the Nethanims are here. Just remember, they were called to come out. They were called to come out on the first day of the first month. Oh, first day of the first month right here. Right? The first day of the... Uh, Ezra was called out on the first day of the first month, right? And then he had to give a cry to his brethren, the Levites that were still in error and conf confusion. So he came out first. The priest came out first. And they said, wait a minute, we can't just come out here ourselves as priests. We need Levites. So then the Levites came out, right? Uh, okay, there you go. So that's, that's why the understanding of priests, Levites, and Nethanims are very important. Because when their binding times are all joined together, that is the harvest time. Right? The harvest time is when the, the, the uh, tares are separated from the wheat. Okay. At midnight, the tares, which is the foolish priest, uh, is separated from the wise priest. Just like at midnight, who stood up from the table and walked out into the night? Judas. Judas. He walked out of the out of the out of the company of Jesus and the rest of the eleven disciples, right? Judas left at midnight. Right? So that's when the that group was purged. Alright? Okay. So now we're, we come to, we come to uh, the wheels within the wheels. This is the part that uh, I showed before. The wheels upon the wheels. The way marks, all these way marks, right? These are way marks, right? 89, 9-11, Midnight Cry, Nassau Sunday Hill. These are turning points. 1989 is the turning point for the glorious land, which is United Nations and the leaders of the spiritual Israel. Why? Because they start the four abominations. It's nine, this is 1989. 9-11 is the turning point for who? The priest. Why? Why was it turning point for the priest? Why is it a turning point for the priest? Because they have to decide that they have to come out of the bride's house, right? Yeah. And where were the foolish virgins and the wise virgins when they had to wait, when they had to tarry? Where were they tarrying? Outside the bride's house, right? So they had, they had to decide to come out of the bride's house at 9-11. The priests have to, that's their turning point. 9-11 is their turning point. All right. Is the midnight cry a turning point for the Levites? Yes. yes, because when they find out, you know what, this priest, they have been predicting something's going to happen at midnight cry and it happened. 
So what do they have to do? What do they have to decide to do? They have to come out of the rebellious house of Israel, right? Yeah, the Levites have to join here because they say, oh, you guys are right. And they're not teaching this in the rebellious house of Israel. We better come out and join you guys here. And then what happens at the Sunday law? The Nethanim says, oh, you're right. <laughs> We're going to have to join. We have to come out of Edom, Moab, and Ammon, right? We have to come out of Edom, Moab, and Ammon and join you. Right? So these are turning points. So what is the turning point within a wheel? What's the turning point of a wheel? Literally. Oh, the, axle. the axle, yeah, uh -huh. right? Okay. The axle is the turning point. That's the axle, right? Uh -huh. There you are. Uh -huh. That's the axle? That's the axle? Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. This is the axle? Uh -huh. And this is the other axle, uh -huh. right? These are the lines, the turning points, the turning points for all. Oh. And what happens when it all turns? Yeah, it's confusion. Harmon but, yeah, but it's actually harmonious. I thought that was that was really Keeps you moving. Yeah, I thought that was me. Yeah. So when you understand the line upon line and all the interconnection and how it relates to each other, then it works harmoniously. And it works harmoniously. You are given. It's like you are being touched. Yeah. Your lips are being touched. Yeah. yeah with the life call, or you're given the understanding, or it is as if. And it is as if you are understanding the sign of Jonah at midnight mm -hmm. or the writing on the wall. Didn't Dan Daniel? Yeah. He says, come in, hey, at midnight there's a writing on the wall here. And Daniel understood it. Mm -hmm. right? So your understanding Ezekiel 1 visions of wheels within the wheels at midnight. Because that's when Ezekiel gave, was given it, right? Mm -hmm. The fifth day of the fourth month. Mm -hmm. That's midnight. Ezekiel was given this vision, so we're going to understand it at midnight. And that, that's basically part of also understanding the sign of Jonah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're almost there. The sign of Jonah is a big thing. We're going to have to do that, you know, at some point. The sign of Jonah is a big, big thing. It's actually understanding the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and receiving of the Mara experience when Jesus is in you. Because he says, what is, what is the sign? What did the priest and the scribe say? What is the sign? Yeah, sign? And Jesus says, well, those who are looking for the sign, they don't even deserve the sign. Because they don't even know what the sign is. But it is the sign of Jonah. And I, actually, this one standing in front of you is even bigger than Jonah. Right? So what is, what is he saying? I am the sign of Jonah. Right? So what is the sign of Jonah? When I am in you, when you have the Mara experience, that is the sign of Jonah. Part of it. Because there's a lot more to that. Yeah, there's a lot more understanding. There's a lot more. There's Islam. There's going to be an arrest. There's going to be accusations and everything. All that is and understanding what's going to come at midnight, right? Okay. So, we go back to Daniel 4 and Daniel 5. All right, this is Daniel 4. What happened at midnight? He had to give, he was called by Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. And Nebuchadnezzar called him because what, what was the qualification of Daniel when he was called at midnight? Nebuchadnezzar said, you know what? You are the ones that is filled, you are the one that is filled with the spirit of the gods. And everybody else, uh, they're not. You are the one that can decipher this dream of mine about the tree, right? Yeah. That tree is cut down and Daniel said, that tree is cut down and you have to eat grass with the beasts of the field, which is the wild asses, right? So in a way, he was talking about the wild asses there. He is predicting Islam somehow. 
deep in that understanding of it, he is, among other things. Right? And who else uh, made a prediction about midnight? Daniel again, in Daniel 5. Right? Way back, later, much later, he gave it to Belshazzar. Mm -hmm. Belshazzar, which is the grandson yes. of no, Nebuchadnezzar. No. He gave the prediction, because the, the handwriting on the wall, he had to decipher that at the at midnight cry. He was brought in at midnight cry. He had to decipher what was written here. And what, what did he decipher? That Cyrus is going to come. Cyrus is already here. And he's going to break down the walls. And he's going to, well, he's going to come in. And he's going to take over this Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia. The kings of uh, Medo-Persia, the kings of the east is going to come in. Meaning he's giving a what kind of message? That's a judgment message, right? So in Daniel 5, he was given a judgment message. In Daniel 4, what kind of message was he giving? Well, in, yeah, it was also a judgment message, but it's also an Islam message, message about Islam. Yeah, the beast. Yeah, beast of the field. Okay. So when we, we combine this together, we realize that there's, Daniel is giving, giving interpretation two kinds of interpretation. And we ex have to extrapolate it to the time of the Millerites. So now we're going to go to the time of the Millerites. Who gave, who gave predictions at midnight? Samuel Snow and Josiah Litch. Right? You know, the thing about it is, that when we understand it, there was also predictions given by William Miller. So we'll go into that a little bit more. But the ones that are famous are Litch and Snow. All right? We'll go into, uh, we'll go there. Uh, we don't have time for today to go into William Miller's uh, predictions. But we'll go, we'll do a little bit about uh, Litch, all right? How's, how are we with time? 110. Ah, oh, we're okay. All right, we're still okay. We gotta. We'll. We'll have to go at least finish Lich. Now we're. We're not gonna go as deep as we used to. We'll just. Uh, we'll go make a summaries of what we understand. Uh, we what we studied before. Okay. Josiah Lich. He made a prediction. In 19 and in 1838. He published a prediction the, in his book, or maybe his pamphlet, The Probability of the Second Coming of Christ about A.D. 1843, in page 158. What did he write? But when will this power be overthrown? According to the calculations already made, that the five months ending 1449, the hour, 15 days, the day, one year, and the month, 30 years, and the year, 360. What is this? The 391 years and 15 days. The power that will be overthrown is actually whose power? At the end of 391 years and 15 days. The Ottoman Empire, which is Islam. So what kind of prophecy was he saying is about to be fulfilled? Something about Islam, right? right it's about Islam. The prophecy is the most remarkable and definite, even descending to the days of any in the Bible. Relating to these great events, it is as singular as the record of time when the empire rose. So he understood about 391 and 15 days, and it will end, what did he say? Sometime in the month of August. Was he very precise? No, he wasn't very precise, but he, was he accurate though? Yes, he was accurate, but he was not precise. Do you remember statistics? Precise and accuracy? Precision and accuracy. Was he accurate? It's in the month of August. Was he accurate? Yes. Was he precise? No. No. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. For, for those who are, 
who've taken uh, statistics, you have to know the difference between precise and accurate. All right. Okay. We have to do this a little bit. We have to understand what is the 391 and 15 days, 391 years and 15 days. Where is that in the Bible? That prediction is in what? Revelation 9. Yeah. Okay. You have to go back though. You have to go back to the fifth trumpet. And the fifth trumpet is associated with which woe? Hmm? The first woe. The fifth trumpet is associated with the first trumpet. The fifth trumpet starts at 606. Right? That's the fifth trumpet. The first woe starts on July 27, 1291. Because Islam first attacked, first attacked uh, the Byzantine Empire with the first wall. And that first wall ended in 1449. Because how long is this first wall? Five months. How long is five months? 150 years, right? 1299 to 1440. This is five months. This is the first war is five months. Okay? All right. And then directly it's followed by the sixth trumpet, right? And the second war is contiguous with the first war. The second war is contiguous, right? So but this is the sixth trumpet. And from 1449, the second war will, end, will take how long? It will end after 391 years and 15 days. This is 391 and 15, and it will end at 1840. All right. So this power came up here, and it is going to go down here. Right? Right. Okay. When will this power be overthrown? He was talking about these. Right. Okay. All right. We'll go into this a little bit more. Right? I will summarize this a little bit. This is just a brief overview of what, is, what happened. What ha when it goes up, it's going to go down. Right? The beginning is like the ending. Here also is going to be, it's going to go up here, but it's going to go down here. How it goes up, it's reverse of how it's going to go down. Right? How, how the papacy goes up is also how it goes down. You know, that's how Islam goes up is how Islam goes down. All right. This is his second prediction that he printed. No, this is uh, Josiah Lich. Josiah Lich in 1841. Now, see, so yeah, wait a minute, 1841. But the thing about it is this was... This addition in the EGW CD ROM is from 1841. He initially he initially made this prediction in May of 1840. Right? It was it was published in June 1, 1840, but he made it in May. This literary notice was from May 1840, but it was published on June 1, 1840. Right? What did he say? The whole period, meaning the whole period of 150 years plus 391, 15 days, will end in August 1840. So he said, will end in August 8. Was he accurate? But was he was accurate? But was he precise? He was not yet precise. So in uh, in in May. In May 1840, he repeated his first prediction. All right. Then he made his precise prediction. And this precise prediction, uh, he made, he published it in, on August 1, 1840. And he made, he, he predicted it, that it will end in the, 11th of August, 1840, right? 11th of August. Ten more days. Ten days, ten days before it happened, he 
predicted it and printed it, right? So he fine-tuned it. <coughs> Before he was just in the ballpark range, he was accurate, but he was not precise. But here he was precise to the exact date, right? So he made three predictions, but the first two were really the same thing. The first two was just accurate, but not precise. The third one here is precise and accurate, all right? Okay. Now, this is the, this is the actual printing of that article in the Morning Chronicle published in London, September 18, 1840. This is the whole thing, right? And this is the, the article that was eventually used by all the pioneers, including Ellen White, when she wrote in the Great Controversy. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch. So what? Two years before 1840? 1838. One of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Roman, uh, Ottoman Empire, and specifying not only the year, but the very day in which this would take place. So this is the fulfillment of the second woe, which, part is, which is part of the sixth trumpet. So Ellen White is endorsing the sixth trumpet, the second woe, happening in this 1840. The issue is that a lot of, <laughs> uh, we can't be confused because a lot of people are still teaching that the trumpets are in the future. Be not be ye not confused, right? Because Ellen White endorsed the second woe and the sixth trumpet happening in being fulfilled on the 11th of August, 1840. This publication was widely pub published and thousands, uh, there you go, thousands, watched the course of events with eager interest. At the very Time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of the Christian nations, right? So Turkey relinquished its supremacy to the Christian nations. So that did, did Turkey, I mean uh, the Ottoman Empire, was the Ottoman Empire annihilated and, uh, you know, uh, was completely, uh, their power was completely gone? No, they actually wasn't. Oh, they, still have the, they still had the Ottoman Empire. When did the Ottoman Empire uh, end? RC, remember your history? 1920. 1922, actually. The, the last sultan was taken out of office in 1922. Yeah, 1922. But anyway, so the power was not completely gone. The supremacy was gone because now if the supremacy, supremacy was given to the Western powers. Right. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretations. What is the prophet, principles of prophetic interpretations adopted by William Miller and his associates? They... Day and year principle, but what also? The 14 principles of Millerite. Yeah, the 14 rules of Millerite. And what is that? Proof texting and line upon line. Without that, they would not have gotten here. They could not figure out this day. And it became a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement, right? Uh, that prophecy was fulfilled and it became an impetus to the preaching that Jesus was going to come in 1843 or 1844. So now people say, hey, you know what? You're right about Revelation 9, 391 days and 15, 391 years and 15 days. You're right about that. 
you must be right about 1843 also. So that's the impetus, right? And when Jesus is going to come, that's the preaching of the third angel's message, right? So it became an impetus, all right? Okay. So what does that mean in our time? When we make a prediction about Islam, right? Just like Lech did. What happens? It came, it became true. And what, what does that do? It becomes an impetus for the judgment message, the Sunday law, right? Right? Yeah, because that's what happened with Lich. When he predicted Islam is going to lose its supremacy, and it did, did it became an impetus to the preaching of Jesus coming at 1843 or 1844, and that's Sunday law. So for us, if we make a prediction about Islam and it comes true, then our prediction about the Sunday law will be receive an impetus from that fulfillment of that prophecy. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see. The first prediction, sometime in August 1840. The second prediction, it will end in August 1840. <coughs> the third prediction, it will end in the 11th of August 1840, which is the signs of the times, right? So we'll see. This is August 11, 1840. That's when the Ottoman Empire relinquished its supremacy, right? The first time he gave it, right here, he gave it in 1838, right, 1838. The second time he gave it in May 1840, but this is essentially the same, it's the same. This and this is the same prediction, he just did it twice. He, pr he printed it twice. And right here, the, uh, he printed it on August 1, 1840, and 10 days later it came true. And this was the fulfillment of what time prophecy? Right here. 391 years and 15 days. All right. Okay. What verse in the Bible is the 391 days? How years is Revelation 9, verse 15. Okay, so I think this is where we'll end. We're going very slow deliberately because there's a lot, a lot of things to review, right? It's not like we didn't study this before because we did, right? Okay, we have to slowly fit this together. But I'm going to, I'm going to tell you because this 1838 message predicts 1840. 38 predicts 40, all right? And that is actually in the Bible because we can find 38 and 40 in the Bible too. So that's what we're going to do next week. All right, and all this is a more assured word of prophecy. prophecy. Okay. What is the historical, I'm looking for historical evidence of August 11th. There's also like the London Convention in July, but... I, because it's it's right right there. It's published in the uh, it's in the London. It's published by a secular newspaper that that actually happened. Yeah. So it is confirmed by secular uh, secular history that uh, the Ottoman Empire did give up its supremacy to the so four had, like Egypt, one Sultan, one right. Alexandria, yeah. and then he surrendered or something. Right. So That's it was right. Like, Egypt right, because Egypt was uh, Egypt was uh, like right. Egypt wanted to take over the Ottoman Empire because Egypt wanted a wanted a more conservative brand of Islam, because the Ottoman Empire had become so Westernized. Yeah. And Islam said, "No, we can't have this this very liberal type of Islam. We have to go back to the really." Conservative, Wahhabi. Wahhabi, yeah, Wahhabi. Okay. There was uh, Prussia. There was Russia, Great Britain, Prussia, and uh, is it France? Prussia and the one right south of it, Prussia. Austria. Austria. Well, Prussia Austria. is Austria. 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 All right. Austria. 
Okay. Because I didn't have to go to a 